Hello, welcome everybody. My name's Glenn Lowry and I'm the Associate Dean of Outreach and Innovation in the Faculty of Art. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome you all to OCAD University on behalf of President Sarah Diamond and Dean Vladimir Spikanovich. We are thrilled that you are here with us tonight. Um, OCAD U respectfully acknowledges the ancestral territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Odnashone, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. The original owners of the land on which we work, think, and create. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words about this important partnership between the power plant and OCAD-U. We have some key objectives. First and foremost is promoting dialogue and discourse around contemporary art. We are also using this opportunity to bring leading artists to OCAD-U and to the general public to promote an awareness of the power plant's programming, excellent programming, I should add, and to foster cross-institutional collaborations that provide rich experiences for students, staff, and faculty. We also see this as an opportunity to build our local and international reach together. This is the fourth co-presentation with the power plant. The first talk was with um, Michael Landy in September of 2017. That was followed by an international lecture series talk by Ralph Rogoff in April of 2018, and then an artist talk by Carla Black in October of 2018. Tonight we are delighted to have Alicia Henry in conversation with Dinah Agaitis and to continue this partnership. Before I give up the microphone, I'd like to say a few thank yous to the power plant, Gechan Verna, Josh Schumann, and Kendra Campbell, to the OCAD marketing and communications team, Sarah Curry, and her staff, Christine Crosby and Natalie Pavlenko, and to Josh Rubino, my assistant, who's been working tirelessly behind the scenes, doing a lot of the heavy lifting to make sure everything is in place tonight. So thank you, and thank you all for coming. It's uh, wonderful to see you here. I'm going to pass the microphone off to Justine Cohill, the RBC Curatorial Fellow at the Power Plant. Welcome. Thank you, Glenn. So yes, I am Justine Khalil, RBC Curatorial Fellow at the Power Plant, and I'd like to start off by thanking you all for joining us this evening for what I am sure will be an exciting and engaging in-conversation program. So we could not offer programs like this without our innumerable supporters. Uh, for winter 2019, our public program sponsor is TD The Ready Commitment. We would also like to thank BMO for their continued support of the Power Plant's All Year All Free initiative, which provides free admission and access to our exhibitions and programming to as many people as possible. Thank you, too, to our government funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council for their continued support of the gallery's year-round operations. I also hope to see you Friday, January 25th for the opening of our winter 2019 season as we present three major solo exhibitions by artists Omar Ba, Shuvanaya Shuna, and of course, Alicia Henry, all of whom create complex worlds drawn from deeply personal iconographies that furthermore reveal shared concerns and hopes for the future. And now let's turn to today's program, which brings together artist Alicia Henry and guest curator Dinah Agoudis in conversation. So for the last two decades, Henry has been exploring an unconventional approach to portraiture, using the face to represent something that is hidden, revealed, and performed. 
a native of Illinois, Henry received her BFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She later went on to earn her MFA at the Yale University School of Art. And during this time and since, Henry has received numerous awards and fellowships, including the School of the Art Institute of Chicago Merit Award, the Ford Foundation Fellowship, the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture Fellowship, and the Guggenheim Fellowship, to name but a few. And her work has been exhibited throughout the United States and abroad since 1991. She is also a professor of art at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the oldest black universities in the United States. Henry stresses that the creative process is unique for each artist and even for each artwork, emphasizing that there is no prescribed formula. Indeed, artists must be willing to experiment with different media and procedures to best express their ideas. And I have a feeling that Alicia and Dinah will elaborate on this point during their in conversation. Dinah Agoudis is an independent curator and chief curator emirata at the Vancouver Art Gallery, where she led the development of the gallery's exhibitions, publications, and collections from 1996 to 2017. Among the 100 plus exhibitions she has curated or co-curated are solo exhibitions by Rebecca Belmore, Douglas Copeland, Song Dong, Stan Douglas, and Jeffrey Farmer. She was formerly director of the visual arts program at the BAMF Center for the Arts, and has held curatorial positions at Walter Phillips Gallery in Banff, Western Front in Vancouver, Convertible Showroom also in Vancouver, and Franklin Furness in New York City. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Alicia Henry and Dinah Agoudis. Get the arrangement right here. Uh, well, thank you very much, Glenn, for the welcome, and Justine for the introduction. Um, it's great to be in Toronto, such a thriving and lively art scene here. And it's nice to experience a real winter as well that we're certainly having here. And I also want to thank the power plant for the opportunity to be working on this exhibition, and especially Gaetan Verna, its director, not only for having such an uh, inspiring and diverse program of activity at, at her gallery, but also for introducing me to the work of Alicia Henry. She was the matchmaker, <laughs> and I want to acknowledge that. And, um, We've had a, a great time, I would say, over the last year working on the exhibition that will be opening on Friday. I had the great privilege of uh, visiting Alicia in Nashville last summer and seeing the context that you work in, uh, going to your home, um, meeting your family, um, um, seeing the university, and I'm a firm believer that context is something that shapes who we are. So maybe you can talk about how Nashville has shaped who you are as an artist. Okay. So what brought me to Nashville was Fisk University and their great art collection. At some point during my teaching career, I wanted to teach at a historically black university and Fisk had great, great collection. And so that really is what um, brought me there, um, the love of art. And then when I was in Nashville, the South is very welcoming, and that is a draw. And sometimes it's a little sweet for some people's taste, uh, and it's a history with the South and the brown black body, but uh, it still is a, a cultural way that is very welcoming and inviting, and I like it, and it is interesting. Um, I'll tell you a, a brief little story um, about an experience I had. So I was going on a road trip from Nashville almost across to the west, uh, to Arizona. And I was on the road just taking off and my car indicated that there was something wrong with the tire. So I you know, make it to the edge of the, the road, pull off, go to a little gas station. Uh, I don't know what the town was, but it wasn't far outside of Nashville. 
and I go in to get some change. I tell them what happened because you have to pay to, you know, put air in the tire. I was hoping that was just what it was needed. Uh, so I went out and there was a, a nail or something in the tire. So then I need to get money to make a phone call. And the people uh, in the gas station store um, said, oh, this guy, he'll go out, he'll take care of it for you. Uh, I was gonna call AAA, you know, they're my go-to number when something happens with the car. But this guy, he comes out, it's really hot in the dog days of summer, um, if you've ever been in the south in, in the summertime. And he gets on the ground, gets scuffed up, you know, little scratches. He puts on the dummy um, tire, he tells me where to go, the next sort of off ramp, and that these people could fix my tire. You know, I'm going to Arizona, and I've maybe 10 minutes outside of Nashville. So uh, I was a little hesitant even to go to this little shop because, you know, you never know. A single female, you know, what could it be? Will I be welcomed, whatever. Uh, so these thoughts were in my head, but after this guy did all he did and then sent me on my way, uh, I went to the next place and has anyone seen Deliverance, the movie? Mm -hmm. okay. So if you haven't, take a look at it. This was in my head as I went there. Um, and I think, I'm, this is long and rambling, but I'm sort of speaking about biases and preconceived notions that we all sort of carry. Anyway, so I'm at this car place that makes me think of deliverance and he says no problem the tire will be fixed you can go to Arizona and back no problem or longer and he fixes it charges you know me very little he, the nail is uh, taken out he makes a ring for me uh, with the nail uh, no extra charge <laughs> and I went on my way and that tire was good for years but you know going to the south I had friends that say oh, why are you there? I mean, is it okay? Thinking about the history, you know, of that. But it's a new day. There obviously are still issues, but that type of generosity and, I mean, I wouldn't even have been that generous. Uh, maybe I'm more generous now, but those two <coughs> men were great. Mm -hmm. and, and so that... Um, type of attitude in terms of helping the volunteer state, they call it that, that for a reason, um, but that had to do more with the early 1800s. But, so that feeds into the work. I guess that's a little convoluted, you all, but <laughs> hopefully you get the gist. Well, it reminds me of uh, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day in the United States, and in looking at uh, social media, I came across a quote that was, um, that was in somebody's post. And it was a quote that said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? All right. um, so that's such a hopeful and optimistic view of the future, isn't it? That, so is there a legacy of Martin Luther King in, in Nashville? I know that he came a couple of times during the civil rights movement. Yeah, he was on Fisk campus. He was all, you know, throughout that area. So there's definitely um, that presence of him and others that were very active in making change. And so even FIS students, TSU students, uh, American uh, Baptist college students were at the forefront of desegregation of the lunch counters in Nashville. Nashville was one of the first southern states to, de uh, to do that. Um, and there was some violence, but it wasn't like some southern states. So that rich history is there. Um, and all of that is of you know, interest to me. Uh, and so being on FIS campus with uh, such a important um, <clears throat> history uh, in so many ways is very fulfilling to me as a professor, but also as a person and an artist. So it all ties in. I think everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, I can work wherever, but again, it's all interconnected. So these things are important, these experiences. Um, are important, these exchanges that we have with uh, people that we meet. Um, and so to recognize your own biases and prejudices uh, 
and to have it magnified is a good thing. Well, why don't we jump into the work? Your work is figurative. Um, what compels you to work with the body? So it's just endless possibilities. And as a form, as a shape, uh, the intricacies of all those interactions that we have uh, with others and even the layers in ourselves. So I've always been interested in, in, in the figure, even as a young child. I feel like the body has many possibilities, as you say. It's the site of history. It's uh, full of emotion. It can evoke politics. It's visceral. It's the flesh. And somehow, in your work, you manage to bring out a lot of these elements. Does your work begin in one of these places specifically? The, I think the history, or the social, or the fleshy, or emotional? I think emotional, the personal, and then it always radiates to all those other things. Because I think you start there, for me. Um, and then it hits on you know, cultural, historical, social, political, um, but starting with the personal. Mm -hmm. um, how much, uh, how much um, do you think about the expressiveness in the, f in the faces themselves? Um, and, and whose faces are they? So uh, sometimes it might be my face, it might be people that I know, faces that I find interesting, uh, and it can be a combination of all of those. Uh, you know, the imagination is a wonderful thing. So using that, you bring all these things into play. I do, um, and that's what I find interesting. Otherwise, I think I'd be a, a different type of painter. Uh, exploring different types of issues and visual concerns. Um, I also find the direct stance of your figures to be very confident and affirmative. And can, can you talk more about this direct stance and the return of the gaze particularly? So I like that sort of assertiveness of a frontal confrontation. And when women are assertive, they're often thought of as being problematic. And so with a lot of the women, I like them to be very frontal and in your face. Just yeah. To, just to they're very confident, them. but there's a vulnerability that exists there, too. Yeah, so there's, there's also a softness. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been said that the eyes are the window on the soul, and you, you treat your eyes in a multitude of different ways. Can you talk about some of those different ways? So when they're cut out, uh, I still think visually you enter there and place whatever you might be thinking in those voids, right? So I like to play with that. Sometimes they are voids because the idea that the eye has been taken out or is missing. So you see that in some of my pieces and that's more literal, but sometimes it's really more symbolic at playing around with those those sort of ideas. And what about uh, the materials? You, your work um, utilizes a multitude of materials. Do you want to talk about some of those? So the cotton and linen, plastic, paper, uh, I really use what I think is best for the medium, the, for the for the idea I'm trying to visually con convey. And so the, the media, uh, it varies, it changes. Uh, wood might be more appropriate, sometimes clay. Uh, and so I'm really looking for that thing, which is a good match to come for my idea to come across. Yeah. And uh, there's a wonderful installation that's made out of leather at the power plant. And maybe you can talk about how you treat the leather and, and created that work. So, uh, with the leather, it's been stained and dyed. Um, I also uh, stitch on it, and I heat it, uh, and sometimes it's boiling for a really long time, and sometimes not so long. Um, I cut it, uh, manipulate it, um, sometimes I take it outside and hang it out for some days. So I do a lot of manipulation with it uh, to get the effect that I want with the faces. And sometimes it's just painted and you'll see these portraits that are more, uh, less stylized than the ones that are at the power plant right now. 
Well, the leather is especially evocative. It's very skin-like, and when it dries, it shrivels up. It, right. um, it just carries such enormous uh, emotional power with right. it. Right, the weight of that, that skin. It's crude, yeah. but very delicate. Yeah. Um, you started with the drawing foundation. Do you want to talk about drawing in your work? So everything starts with the drawing for me. Um, I love sketching, and I keep my sketchbooks, whether um, they're really nice ones or you know ratty ones. I, I keep them, um, and I, I'll sketch on uh, a napkin, anything that's handy. But that's so important just to begin my idea. And everything starts with a sketch. And then from the sketch, I will take it to the next level uh, and start manipulating whatever that material is suited for um, the piece. Yeah. And in her introduction, Justine talked a little bit about your process. Do you want to elaborate on, on the process of actually having an idea and then how a work is actually constructed, the different phases? So my studio routine is fairly regular. Um, and so I have a house home studio and it's really uh, convenient because with teaching, it's very time consuming. And so to be able to be able to go into the studio whenever I want is really important. And so again, with the sketches and looking at the sketches and then moving to the material that works for the piece, uh, is vitally important. And then maybe cutting, stitching, staining, dyeing, painting, and moving it around in that space. Uh, really playing with those materials. It has to be that type of energy so that it stays fluid. But uh, in installing uh, your work over the last week at the power plant, I also saw um, a very strong intuition about placing things as you were developing installations. There weren't a lot of drawings there. I think th I sense that you maybe make the drawings and, and then you embody what that idea is and you also have a very strong formal sensibility where you can be placing things and immediately recognize if you put something over here then maybe you need something over there and then over there. So right. I was really impressed with your ability to do that very quickly, spontaneously, immediately. And, and that's because of the drawing. Because uh -huh. once you've thought of all different types of scenarios, it's, 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 in my, it's in essence in my body almost. I mean, because I planned it out you know, with the drawing. And then, like you said, formally, you know what works, you know why it works. We know what those elements and principles are. And then, you're really free to experiment and knowing what mm -hmm. the conclusions can be, should be, could be. Right. Yeah. Um, in terms of some of the mark making, you also do a fair bit of um, sewing. You often cut things and then suture them together. Uh, so there's not just the physical mark making, but also uh, a, a metaphorical uh, sense to it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? So the thread, the yarn, is another line. And so I really see it like that. I do like craft, right? I like textiles, quilts, needlework. Um, but it's really all about the line and making whatever you want to say work within that line. So it's very similar to the drawing. Mm -hmm. And it's part of what you're evoking there, pain and, and suffering, because they really are like cuts. Um. Uh, sometimes it is, it, I wanted to evoke that, sometimes it really is formal in terms of just directional, in terms of uh, moving the eye in a certain direction. But yes, definitely sometimes it's about a wound, a pain, a scar, an absence, yeah. You also do a lot of layering in your work, um, one body on top of another body or one uh, layer of a face on top of another one. What do these layers allow you to do? So to play with history in terms of the past, the present, the future, uh, you know, the 
family, the idea of the family, not just your, you know, your born family, but the big idea of family and all those connections and those uh, interesting things that we love and hate. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's great in that way. They also make me think of facades too, and and sometimes these things are maybe masks, like that outer. Uh, exterior is maybe not what is inside a person, mm -hmm. uh, what we see on the outside. Um, I couldn't help, speaking of masks, I couldn't help when I was visiting you noticing that you had a wonderful mask collection. Do you want to talk about how those masks came to yeah. you? Yeah. So uh, you all maybe have picked up things here and there and then people know that you like something and then they start getting those things, bringing those things to you. So that's a little bit. So that, uh, thanks. That uh, happened with a lot of the masks. So I received some from my family and from friends. Of course, I've gotten some myself, but yeah. And some of those you would have gotten when you were in Africa. Do you want to talk about that experience? So uh, I was uh, in Ghana, West Africa. I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years, and I wanted and to, since I was very young, be a Peace Corps volunteer. And I put it off. Um, I had an application when I was a undergraduate and didn't mail it and kept putting it off. Uh, there was graduate school, there was the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown for almost two years where I had a residency. Uh, and if anyone is interested in interesting residencies, that's definitely one to look into. It's a great residency where you uh, receive uh, a stipend, have a studio, and it's for visual and uh, visual artists and writers. But anyway, so at a certain point, as I like to say, you just know that there's no perfect time to do anything. So if you want to do something, you have to make time for it, even if it seems inconvenient. So. I finally mailed off my application and I received, a, I forget what the, how it rolled out, but ultimately I had to go to the province town, which is a very small place, to the police station, which was a, not a traditional idea of a police station. It was like a little small house with a one police officer and he had to take my fingerprints. And so it was the first time he had had to do that for this sort of Peace Corps thing. Anyway, so we got a laugh out of that. Um, but I was very open with my application and never thought I would be teaching art. I thought I'd be doing something the forestry or maybe teaching English. But there were two countries in uh, Africa, as it turns out, that requested art educators. And so I was in a small village and I was teaching art and being influenced by so many fantastic things around me. I lived with a family, there was no electricity, there was a, you know, a hole to take care of certain you know, bodily functions and you just adjust. When I got there and um, they showed me where I'd be you know, sleeping, it was a very small space, and I thanked them, shut the door, and burst out crying. Because I was like, how can I do this for two years? Um, but you, know, you make a way and make whatever changes you need to if you really want to do something. And I wanted to be there. And uh, I'm really glad I did it. And what are some of the profound things that you learned while you were there? Not to eat eggplant, that's not true. It was something I ate at a wedding that I developed hives and had to um, make my way to Accra, to the capital, to the med unit. Um, and there are these things called trotros, so they don't move. This is years ago, so things are, you know, everything changes. So they don't move until the all seats are sort of paid for. So you might arrive at eight o'clock and maybe you won't leave until four o'clock. So imagine if you are sick and you're, you know, that's just what, how it had to be. But um, the family, the community, the art, 
the uh, the functional you know utilitarian things that uh, were beautiful art objects, the soap making, all happening in a small village. Um, I would go somewhere, um, and the family I lived with, I called them mommy and poppy, and maybe I wouldn't, um, I was in an accident in Kumasi, which is um, the next big place uh, after Accra. And so I didn't think anything of it, nobody was hurt, I went on, did what I did, and then when I got back to the house, she was asking me about the accident. I'm like, how did she know about the accident? I didn't even <laughs> tell her. Um, but of course, this is without cell phones, so you know, people communicated and they knew what was happening and looked out for you. I mean, Peace Corps was not there; they were in a cross. So when you were where you were living, you would need to be connected with the people that were there, and they watched out for you, and you would watch out for them. But really, they were really watching out for me. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of, I was teaching, but I received so much more than I gave, in my opinion. And do you think that it had an impact on your interest in community? A lot of your work now does deal also with the community of bodies, right. of people. Uh, I think growing up, uh, community was always important. So I grew up where if you did something, then your neighbor would correct you and would just uh, tell your parents, and there would be a conversation. There was no, don't say anything to my child. So I already, I grew up with that type of environment, and so I find that attractive because it is familiar, and I think it is important, and especially in the times that we're living now, where things can be a little separated more than they need to be, in my opinion. And how do you express that idea of community in your work? with the figures and the way they interact, even when if they're solo. I think for me, the story that I'm telling on the surface with the manipulation of the eyes or the nose or the cloth tells that story. Now, again, that's how I see it. You all might tell me something different if I see you on Friday. Or you can always email me too. <laughs> Uh, while you're bringing bodies together into these communities of, of different types, there are other works where you're taking the body apart, quite literally, uh, into fragments and uh, di dissecting it almost, breaking it down. Do you want to talk about um, the piece fragments and how it has come together and why you're breaking down the body? So even though it's fragments, I still see those as full sort of entities even though I know they're all fragmented. So if it's the arm, the leg, the vagina, I still see that as a person. It's just a part of that person, a piece of that person. The other interesting thing about this work is that there's a gradation of color that happens and it goes from very dark to very light and really covers off so many skin tones and, and possibilities and the interchange of body parts and the, the possibility of of improving your body parts, selling your body parts, right. um, having prosthesis. Uh, it's a very evocative work, I think, in that regard. And I think really speaks to the world of hy hybrids that we now occupy. Um, there are some motifs that you've repeated, like the mother and child, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very tender work. Can you talk about this motif and the possibilities of it? So I think, you know, being a nurturer, being a parent, whether you birth the child or you adopt the child is one of the most powerful things. And so I like the, to depict that interaction because uh, there's a lot of interesting possibilities just emotionally um, and physically with the nearness um, or the absence in terms of um, the little boy that might exist. Um, in some of the works, do you use more abstracted references, an abstract language of circles for the nose and a wide white mouth? Um, can you talk about your references of uh, the historical use of blackface? So, the menstrual, the stereotypical images that often uh, 
were used to represent uh, brown, black sort of bodies uh, is very insulting right, and exist in all different types of ways. And so sometimes the work is definitely addressing those ideas that existed and in some places sort of still exist. Uh, and then other times I'm dealing with clowns, the circus, and it's still in a, br a black body. And so it just depends on the way I'm using it for me. Like there are two pieces in the power plant now, couple, and it's less about, it is dealing with stereotype, but it's also dealing with a marriage and the issues surrounding a couple and how they exist and the stereotypes that a male takes on, the stereotypes that a female takes on, et cetera. Uh, the couple is probably the most difficult work for me as a, as a white viewer because the intense stare of especially the female in that work uh, and its, uh, its reference to blackface is just a part of, a horrible part of history that I have to deal with, that I have to contend with. Um, my implications in it, if there are any, uh, and the whole history of racism and how it continues today, and it really makes me um, question myself, my own actions, so it's, uh, for me, it's one of the most powerful works in the show. Thank you. Uh, many of you all have heard of the, the shootings by police on uh, black men or black women in the states, uh, it gets to a point where you almost become desensitized to the violence, whether it's law or just in the community that you live in, it is very difficult. Um, and when you have to, and this has been going on for a long time, have to raise your son or daughter and to teach them how to be safe just because they're walking down the street, that's a heavy burden. It's a physical burden. And so that is an interesting mm -hmm. thing to try to visually convey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how you do it through, <coughs> pardon me, historical references. Mm -hmm. But it still speaks very much to the racism that, that exists today. Uh, there's also a lot of women present in your installation at the power plant, and vaginas abound. Um, are you a feminist at heart? Yeah, I believe in gender equality. I mean, what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and would you consider yourself a political artist? You're you're addressing a lot of, uh, or your work certainly evokes a lot of um, social and political subjects. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a political artist? Well, I consider myself <laughs> an artist, and I think with that, it gives me the right, in my opinion, to touch on any subjects or theme that I want to explore. And sometimes it's flowers and a still life or a landscape, and others it's a clown, and others it might be blackface. Um, so, but that title of an artist for me allows me to explore, to express what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, and the world around me. Um, because we visually record these things, and I think it's important. Are there other contemporary artists who are of interest or inspiration to you? So, I like Mary Cassatt. And I know that someone was talking about they're sick of the impressionist, but I like Mary Cassatt. <laughs> and I'm giving a shout out to her. Alex Catt, right? uh, Melu Jones, Charles White. Um, it's just so many artists that I uh, like. Um, Augusta Savage, right? David Hammonds, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, there's so many fantastic artists 
uh, some that are lesser known um, and some that are, are known you know, worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, the power plant asked you to come up with a list of books that were of interest to you. And are, are books a, a starting place for you sometimes? And are, are, are there any that are particularly inspiring or have been for you? Um, I like Dr. Seuss, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, talk about political, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so sort of this joking, but yeah, Dr. Seuss was really uh, important to me sort of as a kid, and so was the learning tree, or the giving tree, excuse me. You all know that book? The Giving Tree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I still love that book to this day and always give it um, as gifts um, to young people or sometimes older people because the story was just so um, important in terms of a life lesson. Um, anyway. um, even though there's great sadness in a lot of your work, there's also an optimism, I find. And uh, are you optimistic about the future? Well, I think if people are honest with themselves and with the people that they are, are engaging with, then I feel optimistic. If we pretend that everything's okay, that there's no issues, that we don't have any biases or prejudices, then I become less optimistic. Um, I think it's really important as a society that we really ad address things um, and if traditions need to go away, we need to move those along. And does any of, th of the possible optimism come from nature? You've started to include elements from nature in, in your, one of your works at the power plant. Where does nature fit into it for you? It's always changing and it um, can't be stopped. Um, and I love that about nature, um, and that it's uh, always going to come, right? It may be a storm or a fire, but it will rise, it will come. It will prevail, won't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the title, Witnessing, what does that mean to you? So to see and to be seen, I think these are so important. And so that really was something that I wanted for this show. When the viewers are walking in that space, to have that feeling that they are a part of a bigger thing. And we see you and um, we are seen. And, and what is it that you want viewers to take away from your work? that it's important to be yourself, but also it's even more important to function in a larger context. Mm -hmm. Society at large, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Those are all the questions that I have. Do you have anything else to say that I haven't touched on before we open it up to the audience? Well, I'll leave you with the other Nashville experience. I was at a big box store, don't judge me, <laughs> <laughs> and I was getting some rocks, and there was a gentleman, and he offered to help move the rocks, and I took him up on the offer because they were very heavy, and I paid for them, and then I was in the parking lot, and another, this was a younger man, he offered to help get them into my car. So you see why I love Nashville. <laughs> anyway, so that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Very helpful and generous. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, Alicia and Dinah. We have time for a few questions. We'll start one off. Alicia, I'm hoping you could say more about clowns. Usually something that is so fearful isn't viewed with optimism, but clowns often come in families. Clowns have great use of facial expression. Could you tell us more about how clowns feature in your work? 
So um, I don't find, find clowns scary at all. Um, and I love the that performance element of them uh, in terms of making people afraid, but making them happy, uh, making them cry. You know, that is really uh, the thing that I love about them. The costume, right? The theatrics of it uh, was always very uh, exciting for me as a child. And I wanted to you know, join the circus at some point, but that didn't go far. But so that's what the, they are for me, the ability to have great imagination, the makeup, um, to take you someplace totally different um, was really important for me as a child. Um, transform yourself. Thank you. I'm gonna try to get at this question as best as I can. As someone with a body that's visibly afflicted, I have Parkinson's, I'm always concerned how people are looking. And my neuropsychiatrist says people are looking and they're judging themselves as in a mirror. And it's a reflection. And I was taken by your story that you began with, which was, you know, maybe you judging. Mm -hmm. And the work seems so material and bodily. <laughs> Through the making, your body becomes very evident as residue. So I'm curious how the stories like the stories you told us, become, make your story become more personal, and it draws me in. Does that ever play out in the work more directly? So it just depends. Like for some things, uh, there is a, I, I think they do. I think it does creep into the work, um, whether it's with a scar, like with that man at the gas station. He, it was very hot, he was sweating, he got scuffed up and then he had a bruise, he had a scar and it was bleeding. And somewhere I think on his hand or forehead, I don't, or maybe both. Um, and so those types of things come in. Uh, the person, the acquaintance that I, know that was murdered, uh, he lived near, near me. Uh, I think a lot of the nature pieces uh, are my way of sort of dealing with that um, in an interesting way. Uh, individuals that I'm close with, uh, I find that more difficult, but I wanted to sort of deal with that, the death of my father, the death of my best friend, but I'm still sort of grappling with how to address that. But I think in a certain way, those things are st also in the work. But I know with the nature, the sort of uh, re, uh, um, the revelation, the uh, appearance um, of the birds and the flowers, um, the seeds, that is there. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you talk about your practice in the studio. Do you work on many things at one time, or do you have a, a, a sort of umbrella idea that you develop from there and the, the works flow out from? How does, what does that look like? Yeah, so I work on a lot of things generally, and especially if I'm having a show, I work on multiple things. I have to have really good time management because I'm, um, I'm a full-time professor. I have committee <coughs> meetings and all these other things that interfere, so I'm very focused when I am in the studio. And so I'll work on different things shift them around, uh, for example, getting ready for this show, I had a lot going in different spaces in the studio and would move it when, when I needed sort of to have a clear space. I think that's really important to have a very grounded studio 
practice, whatever that is that works for you. And I, I know what works for me, which is usually every day. And that might sometimes me, mean reading something, but often it's doing something. Um, and, and not just doing something that, um, you know, turning on the radio, but actually holding, manipulating something. Not all the time is it successful, right? But uh, I think that's important for an artist to be very regular and disciplined. For, further to that question, um, I wondered about the very large work that you have at the power plant and your ceilings are a lot lower. Yeah. How would you, how did you scale that one up? So there's a large piece, if you see the exhibition, uh, sketches. I did sketches uh, for that piece and I did two smaller versions and two different locations which assured me that the larger version at the power plant would work successfully. I had to make some changes when we got there. I wanted it more centered on the wall but that didn't, that wasn't going to work and so I brought it down and it works quite well. We don't have an image of that. Um. I'm gonna cheat and ask two questions. So um, we'll, we'll all be there on Friday night, but maybe if you could um, speak a little bit about scale. Dinah just asked about that a bit, but are the works human scale or um, how do you think about scale in the work? And then the second question is, um, you know, as, as a teacher, how do you translate your studio practice in to how you teach? How, how does that flow happen with your students? So I think the scale, there's some things that are more monumental and then there's some things that are human size uh, and then some things that are quite tiny in terms of some of the leather pieces and then the flowers and the seeds uh, in the Claire story. And then with... Oh. How big is that, for example, oh. or that? So some, like, uh, like maybe that is uh, like 16, uh, maybe that's 20 inches long. And then, yeah, that's like 20 inches long. That's mixed media, it's cray paw, charcoal, thread, yeah, felt, that's on felt. So with teaching, I try to convey to the students time management, which is really important, and discipline and focus. Being an artist is not for the faint of heart. And if that is something that you really think you want to do, then you really need to be dedicated and driven because there's no not going to be any cheerleaders except for maybe your parents um, uh, cheering you on to, to do this, um, the majority of us. And so you have to have an iron within. And so I try to convey that. Do they listen to me? Do you all listen to your professors? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> No other questions? Well, oh. what, was, what was your motivation starting to Maybe when you were younger or just starting out, you know, what was your motivation for your work or has been since the beginning? Okay. So I wanted to communicate what I wanted to communicate. And the best way for that, I thought, and the teachers that I admired from grade school, because I've been making art since I was a young kid, and loved it, and had validation around that. And so, uh, to be able to be an artist, and also teach, because I admired all my teachers, um, that seemed like a good, Pairing, uh, in terms of why I'm a teacher and why I'm an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alicia, you, you also told me about 
cutting up paper dolls when you were young. Yeah, you know, <laughs> manipulating them, you know, cutting the hair, cutting the heads. Uh, very, you know, similar to what you're seeing behind me right now. My high school uh, art teacher, who you know, I'm still in contact with, Mrs. Ducardi, she never told me this but when I was a student, but I would waste a lot of paper and a lot of art supplies, and she said she would cringe <laughs> when she would say, see me grabbing all this stuff. But she allowed me to express myself. She knew that you know, this was an important part of my process. And so it was only like maybe 10 years ago, you know, I'm very, far removed from high school that she told me, and I was totally shocked. I, I didn't even realize I was being wasteful. So, <laughs> very funny. But anyway, so yes, important um, teachers in my life. And so, I never saw teaching as a negative thing. And I know some of my friends that it's not a good fit for them. And you have to sort of have a sense of who you are and what you want to do, because there's nothing wrong with having a different path than that. It just needs to work for what you need. If there are no more questions, we will close our night here. Again, I want to extend sincere thanks to Dinah and Alicia for coming and sharing. For everyone else, we hope to see you on Friday at 8 p.m. for our opening party. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.